It's my uh, pleasure to introduce uh, the next uh, speaker, Alejandra Rodriguez Verdugo. Uh, Alejandra is a uh, professor at the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at the University of California, Irvine. And uh, uh, she works at the, at the interface between ecology and evolutionary uh, dynamics, doing experiment, uh, trying to uh, combine the two. And today is talking about the evolution of microbial interactions in uh, fluctuating environments. So thank you very much, Ale, for being with us. And uh, feel free to share uh, when you're ready. Yeah. All right. Can you see my screen? Thumbs yes, up. Works excellent. Well, excellent. So thank you so much for the invitation. I'm super excited to be here and to talk about my work that I started in at ETH Zurich when I was a postdoc um, with Martin Ackerman. And then I'm continuing this work right now in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at UC Irvine in California, in the US. And today I would like to talk about evolution of microbial interaction in fluctuating environment. But first, why do we care about microbes. So microbes are the oldest organisms on earth and they have been able to colonize any possible environment on the planet from the driest places such as the Atacama Desert in Chile to the icy lakes of Antarctica. So microbes have been able to thrive and adapt to the harshest condition. And not only they have amazing adaptability, but we know they are very important for life on earth. So many of these microbes underlay the biogeochemical cycling on element on earth, and then therefore are essential for ecosystem functioning. And we know that many of these functions are not performed by microbes in isolation, but they are performed by many microbial species. That means uh, it's really microbial communities that underlay these functions. And now we know also that these microbes are really relevant because for example, they can influence climate change by mediating um, the carbon atmosphere uh, land exchange, and therefore they can actually feed back into the climate. So it's very important that we understand how these microbial communities respond to change. Also, we know that these microbial communities live in close association with animals and plants and they're fine they find their well being and keep us healthy, but sometimes also uh, cause disease. And here in this image, I'm showing uh, a beautiful uh, microbial community of, that lives in our gut, in the human gut. And this gut microbiota, we know is very important for keeping us healthy. And um, there's recent studies that have shown that disrupting these communities with changes of diet or antibiotics can actually lead to chronic disease, such as Crohn's disease or Alzheimer um, or anxiety. And even more um, recent studies can also show that they actually control cognition and behavior. So it's very important that we understand then how disturbing these microbial communities can actually influence our health. And then finally, microbes can help us. So they are used in industry and for example, they are used for energy production and they are the next generation of biofuel which are clean and renewable and also now in industry, they are engineering whole microbial communities, for example, to improve the health and the fitness of the host that carries them, for example, plants. So given the importance for the environment, for health and uh, for industry, more and more people are trying to understand how these microbial communities work. And although this seems a very simple question and very straightforward question, we still don't have a good answer for this. And the reason is because microbial communities, as you already know, are complex systems. So if we look at it, they are composed by populations of one single species, which are interacting with population of a different species. And then this interaction can actually lead to emergent properties uh, that give certain functionality at the group level. And finally, we have to consider that many of these microbial communities live in structured environment and fluctuating environment. So then the environment also is not static and changes. So one way to approach then this uh, complexity is what we can do is to just isolate some of these 
species. And instead of dealing with the whole complexity of thousands of species from nature, we can just assemble uh, these uh, few species in what we call synthetic communities. And then we can bring them to the lab and study them um, in the lab. So this is the approach that I'm following now in my research group. And then in my research group at UCI, we study two questions. Overall, we are interested in understanding how do species interaction influence evolutionary dynamics. And on the other hand, we're interested in understanding how changes in individuals can influence evolutionary dynamics. And in general, we follow a bottom-up approach, which probably Alvaro Sanchez talked a lot about this. So basically, we use this synthetic communities simplified system. And what we do is we try to build quantitative prediction with mathematical modeling that we can then test with experiments. And then these experiments can inform, um, can feed back to inform or quantitative prediction and mathematical models. And for today, I would like to talk about one project with look at how the species interaction influence evolutionary dynamics. And this um, is in the context of the ecology and evolution of pairwise, uh, positive pairwise interaction. So this work, again, was done at ETH Zurich in collaboration with Martin Ackerman. So what are positive pairwise interaction? So positive pairwise interaction are any interaction between two species where either one of the species get a benefit from the interaction or both of the species get a benefit from the interaction. And we know that these ones are very important for ecosystem uh, functioning. So for example, we know this kind of association occur in nature. And for example, we can think about this mutualistic association between methane oxidizing archaea and sulfide producing bacteria. And these ones are very important for deep subsurface um, ecology and they are really the base of this ecosystem. But for example, a more familiar example, you might be more familiar. So coral reefs, for example, is this association between an animal and an algae. And we know that this actually positive mutualistic association is really the base for these uh, shallow marine uh, ecosystems. So therefore, given they're important for the environment, more and people are in tra trying to understand how stable are these positive interaction. But then one thing one has to consider is that they actually the environment is not static. And for example, we can have that uh, there's changes in resources and these changes in resources in the environment can alter species interaction. So very simplistic, one can imagine the interaction between two species, a squirrel and a bird, that live in an environment with a lot of resources and different kinds of resources. So we have that they have a neutral interaction. But then if the condition changes, and now we have that actually they are in an environment with limited resources, now we have that this, positive, this neutral interaction changed to a negative interaction and now they are in competition. So then we should try to address this question of how stable are positive pairwise interaction, considering that the environment also varies. So to address this question, I use this synthetic community composed by these two bacterial species, which is Acinetobacter and Pseudomonas. And these two bacteria are very interesting um, because they have amazing metabolic capabilities. Also, they, they were isolated uh, from nature, from a polluted aquifer in Denmark. So they coexist in nature. And what we did was to just isolate them and bring them to the lab. And then uh, the metabolic capabilities that they have is that they can degrade uh, aromatic compounds, which are very hard to degrade by many other uh, microbial species or the other species. So they definitely are of interest for bioremediation. And we have, that for example, we can tune the interaction depending on the resources. So for example, if we grow these two bacteria in an environment where we supply them with benzyl alcohol as a carbon source and carbon of energy source, we have that only these bacteria, acinetobacter, can use these benzyl, benzyl alcohol. But then if we grow them in the presence of these other bacteria, what happened is that acinetobacter can actually oxidize this benzyl alcohol, and then it accumulates an intermediate product, which is benzoate, which passively leaks out in the an external environment. And then in the external environment, pseudomonas can utilize this benzoate. 
So we have, in ecological terms, a uh, uh, commensal interaction where Pseudomonas get benefited by the presence of Acinetobacter, and Acinetobacter is neutral to the presence of Pseudomonas. So we have this cross feeding interaction. But then now we would change them in a minimal media where we grow them with citrate as uh, the limiting nutrients. We have that these two species compete for this citrate. So now we have a negative interaction. So as you can see, it's very nice model system because we can then tune interaction depending just on the carbon source. So with this model, um, yeah. So first, how do we measure interactions in the lab? So the way we do it is we use a batch culture system. So that means we just grow these bacteria in a, in a shaking uh, tube with these uh, uh, nutrients. And then we wait until they grow 24 hours. So at the beginning, they have a lag phase. Then they have exponential phase. And then they saturate the nutrients in the media. And then after this whole cycle, after 24 hours, we transfer 1% of the population into a fresh medium. And we continue these cycles for many days. So at the end, the kind of results I'm going to be showing is this kind of graph, where in the x-axis, I have the time in days. And in the y-axis, I have the cell density, which we estimate as colony forming units in agar plates. And then uh, in this particular example, for example, you can see that the blue type is able to sustain this serial dilution regime. So we say that it has a stable population over time. Well, for example, in this particular case, the red type, even though it's able to grow, is not able to sustain this serial dilution regime and it gets extinct after uh, four days. So the first thing we wanted to see is to do these experiments first in what we do is monoculture. So that means we grow them in isolation to see how these uh, bacteria behave. And we can see that Acinectobacter is very good at using this benzyl alcohol. It achieve high cell densities, while Pseudomonas is not very good at utilizing this benzyl alcohol. But then when we do these experiments in co-culture, so now growing them together, we have now a different situation where uh, we have that Pseudomonas achieves two orders of magnitude uh, higher cell densities in the presence of Acinetobacter than just alone. And then uh, what happened in, oh yeah, so also we can visualize actually this kind of interactions using microfluidics and coupling with a microscope. So what I'm going to play now just to visualize this direct cross-feeding interaction is um, I'm representing Acinetobacter as these round cells and then Pseudomonas is in green like a uh, road shape. So you can see that actually if we play this time last movie, we have first the growth of Acinetobacter and this growth is followed by this kind of green, um, green uh, fluorescence and that's the growth of Pseudomonas. So we really see this uh, sequential growth where we visualize this cross-feeding interaction. So now what in the other condition, so in the condition of citrate, when we do our experiments in monocultures, growing them in isolation, we have that both species can grow uh, well in monoculture and achieve high densities. But now when we put them in co-cultures, we do see that actually Pseudomonas is a very good competitor and is such good competitor and it utilizes these citrates so well that it actually outcompetes Acinetobacter only after five days of growing them together. So we can see this very asymmetric um, competition situation. So what we wanted to um, test in this experiment is then uh, how are these, um, I mean, can we predict this ecology and evolution of this pairwise interaction? So what we did was to ask two questions. So how stable are these positive pairwise interaction in block treating environment? So not just keeping the environment constant, and in particular, we ask what happened if we interrupt this positive interaction with period of competition or negative interaction. And our second question we address is how stable are positive pairwise interaction over evolutionary timescales, both in constant and in fluctuating environment. So for our first question, the first thing we did was to build a mathematical model and this was done in collaboration with Clément Villain, which is right now at the University of Zurich. 
And what we did was to build this um, mathematical model that we parameterized with single species growth measurement. So for this part, what we did was to just do grow curves essay of these monocultures. And then from there, uh, we also estimated, for example, the excretion rate of these benzoates by HPLC. And at the end, uh, we end up defining the parameters that are important for our model, which are the maximum grow rate in exponential phase, the maximum uptake rate, which is um, just the rate of uh, how they saturate the uptake rate for high resource concentration. Then uh, we have that another parameter that was very important for our model was the half saturation constant, which is the resource concentration supporting half maximum um, uptake rate. Then the duration of the lag phase, which is how long the bacteria remain in this non-growing state. And finally, the excretion uh, conversion rate, which is a proxy of how much benzoate is excreted in the environment. And then what we did was to just use a set of differential equation in which we uh, model the resources explicitly. And then in, in here, I'm showing those equations. So basically, we just model the bacterial growth, which is dependent on how much of the resources they are using. And then in the second uh, set of differential equation, we have the changes in resources over time, which is related to the growth of the bacteria. And then with this model, uh, well, I mean, I can um, spend a little bit more of time. So basically, as I mentioned before, these basically, um, these dynamics are really related to the maximum growth rate of the bacteria and also is related to the half uh, saturation constant and also to how they are uptaking these resources over time. And then finally to the excretion rate of the benzoate. So the first thing we wanted to do with this uh, model is to just validate the previous result that I show. So basically when we actually use this model, we do see that we can recapitulate the behaviors in monoculture, in co-cultures in benzyl alcohol, and also in uh, citrate, which is the other competition. So we do see that with this model, we can recapitulate and capture these uh, ecological dynamics quite well. So now the question was, what dynamics do we observe in fluctuating environment? So for example, in this case, we define a one day fluctuation environment means that one day we simulate that they grow in citrate and then we transfer them in benzyl alcohol the next day and again to citrate. And that's what uh, we simulate or fluctuate in environment. So when we do this, we do see that when we have it in one day fluctuation environment, the two species can coexist over time. And one species is more favored in one condition than the other. But then um, when we, for example, start increasing, um, the length that they stay in each of the carbon sources. So for example, two day fluctuating uh, environment means that two days they spend in citrates and two days in benzyl alcohol. We do see that we still have species coexistence, but hopefully you can start seeing that uh, the more they stay in one condition, the amplitude between the two species start getting larger and larger. And then when we hit the four and five days fluctuating environment, we do have that actually uh, Pseudomonas bring Asymptobacter to extinction. And this, um, in the model also, what we observe is that Pseudomonas eventually also end up going to extinction. And the reason is because it uh, outcompeted the copolymer that it needed uh, to coexist in this environment. So in these four and five days fluctuating environment, we see a complete extinction of the community. So now we wanted to actually see if we can see these results with experiments. So what we did was to just grow the bacteria in co-culture, uh, starting with a ratio one to one. And we did this in triplicates for six days. And with experiments, we actually see again these dynamics that we actually predicted with uh, the mathematical model. So we have that in one, two, and three, three days fluctuation environment, we have coexistence of these two species with the amplitude between the two getting larger. And then for the four and five days fluctuation, we have extinction of Acinetobacter. So we do not see extinction of Pseudomonas. We just see that Pseudomonas is actually to persist 
at very low densities when, um, when we have them in uh, benzyl alcohol and eventually with citrate, they just recover. So uh, now that uh, we define this part, so the conclusion is that fast fluctuation maintains species coexistence, but for example, in an environment that fluctuates slowly, what we can see is uh, that we observe coexistence breakdown. So all of these that I've been talking about are ecological dynamics. So this is over six days, which is um, around 70 generations for these bacteria. So we assume that evolution is not playing a big role for these ecological dynamics. So the next question we ask is, what happened if we repeat this experiment, but now in evolutionary time scales? And then we were particularly interested about this condition of the cross-feeding interaction. So we wonder how stable is this cross-feeding interaction if we do it over evolutionary time scales. So for example, 200 generations. And the other condition we were very interested in is the one, one day fluctuating environment. So in this condition, we saw coexistence of these two species. So we wonder if we can actually have coexistence over evolutionary time scales. So in order to perform this, we did a large scale evolution experiment in these three conditions. So keeping just benzyl alcohol as a sole carbon source, just keeping citrate, and then in our daily fluctuating environment. And we did these experiments in monocultures and also in co-cultures. And then finally, we did for each of the conditions four replicates. And the whole experiment ran for a month, which is 200 generations. So the first question, so is cross-feeding uh, interaction stable over evolutionary time scales? So here I'm plotting the result of just one of the replicates, which is consortium number two. So you can see that now in the, in the x-axis, I have the, the time now over 30 days, and in the y-axis, I have again the cell density. And then what you can see is that there actually there's species coexistence over evolutionary time scales. And then there's definitely uh, some kind of fluctuations in the cell densities over time. So it's not that constant, but overall for the four replicate or four consortium, we see species coexistence until the end of the experiment. So we concluded that indeed this cross feeding is stable over evolutionary time scales. But now if we actually look at the second condition, which is the one day fluctuating condition, now we do see a different um, case. So for example, here again, I'm plotting just the result for, of one of the consortium, consortium number two. And then here is very interesting because we see that at the beginning of the experiment, the two species coexist and, um, and maintain a certain stable uh, population dynamics, but then around day 14, something happened to one of the species, in this case to Acinetobacter, that it started decreasing in cell density until actually it gets extinct. And even more interesting, at least for an evolutionary biologist, is that actually this outcome of extinction of one of the species was only one of two evolutionary outcomes. So we do see that this extinction occur in two of the replicates but in the other two replicates, we do see coexistence of these two species until the end of the experiments. So then this is very exciting because this is definitely uh, a different evolutionary outcome. So the, the one thing we can do with evolution experiment, which is very nice, is that we can freeze these bacteria at different time points during the experiment. And that's exactly what we did. So we kept a frozen record of these populations at uh, every seven days. So every week we will freeze these uh, whole uh, tubes with the bacteria. So what we can do then is to go back in the experiment, let's say at day 14 before the extinction of one of the species and then revive these bacteria and see, for example, if we do an, a replay evolution experiment to see if we again see the extinction of Acinetobacter or not. And when we did these replay experiments, this time we did it with high replication. So we repeat this experiment for each of the consortium, we did six replicates. So what we do see is that for the two cases where we previously observed extinction of Anticetobacter, 
we again observe extinction of these species when we replay the experiment. And in the other two cases where we previously saw uh, coexistence, we again recapitulate this coexistence when we do this uh, replay ex experiment. So the conclusion is that extinction was a highly deterministic event. So it's not random at all. So we can definitely replay these dynamics. So then the next thing we wanted to know is what is causing this extinction of one of the species. And uh, for answering this question, what we did to, was to isolate some single clones at different time points. So at the end of the experiment at day 14 and at day uh, zero, so which is the ancestor. So we isolated one single clone for each of the replicates of the population. And then we did grow curves experiments. And also we sequenced the full genomes to try to see if there were any genetic changes that could explain these deterministic dynamics. And first I'm going to show the results that we have when we actually do the full genome sequencing uh, at the end of the experiment. So when we take this clone at the end of the experiment, we did the grow curves. So again, we just estimated the uh, maximum grow rate and the yield. And when we do this experiment, I mean, here I'm just summarizing the results of all the experiments, but hopefully you can see that there's a lot of green and the green indicate that there's actually a significant higher growth of the evolved types compared to under ancestral types. And uh, these indicate that actually over the course of the evolution experiments, the evolved type are definitely growing better than the ancestors. So this is already a sign that these strains actually have adapted, have adapted to these conditions. And then uh, when we actually look at the genomes from this single clone, so what we did was to sequence the genome of the evolved type and the sequence uh, the genomes of the ancestral types, and then we just compare the two genomes, and then we call uh, the novel mutations, so anything that was not present in the ancestor and then that we observe in the evolved clones. And overall, we can say that we observe that uh, there's, we observe around one to two fixed uh, mutations per clone. And when we look at where are these mutations uh, located in the genome, we see that these actual limitations are not randomly distributed in the genome, but tended to hit certain uh, genes. So for example, in acinetobacter, we observe 15 mutation in this O acetyltransferase gene. And then for example, in Pseudomonas, we do see that they accumulate mutation in these three genes, which is a sensor protein, a flagellar component, and transcriptional uh, cyclic DGMP. So, um, Basically, we do observe a high level of parallelism, which already indicate that these mutations are most likely adaptive. And then also when we look how they are distributed, not necessarily in the genome, but among conditions, we do see that these ones tend to not be specific to one particular condition, but they were observed in many of the conditions. So for example, in the case of acinetobacter, we do see this mutation in the condition of the constant benzyl alcohol, in monoculture and co-culture, but also in the citrate and in the fluctuating environment. And it's similar uh, in the case of Pseudomonas. So overall, the conclusion is that species show signs of adaptive evolution after 200 generation, but these changes are not specific. So it seems to be general adaptation to the culture conditions. So now we go back to now that we characterize these uh, evolved types, so then we go back to this idea of trying to see what happened at day 14, which is just before the extinction of one of the species. And when um, we go back to that time and we do the full genome sequences, I'm summarizing in this table what we observe. So Pseudomonas, even after 92 generations of evolution, already have a two to one fixed mutation in the genome. And again, this kind of mutation, we observe them in monoculture, suggesting their general adaptation to the culture condition. But I think what's really interesting is that in the case of Acinetobacter, we do see that in the two cases where it went extinct, we do not see mutation at this time point of 92 generation, where in the consortium number three and number four, 
we do see that this acinetobacter uh, has two or one mutation. So our current hypothesis that we are trying to test is that mutations in acinetobacter rescue it somehow from this extinction. And in particular, our hypothesis is the following. So we think that pseudomonas uh, accumulate uh, mutations, so it's rapidly evolved, and these mutations actually confer higher growth uh, to these pseudomonas, and these exert an indirect effect on acinetobacter, which either has to, um, it goes extinct, or it has to keep up with this higher growth of pseudomonas, higher competition, and then uh, it can actually, if it has adaptive mutation, then it can coexist with pseudomonas. And this hypothesis is again uh, sus sustained by this observation that pseudomonas actually has higher growth after 92 generation. So uh, we think it's really the mutation that is causing this higher growth. And also um, the second line of evidence to support our hypothesis is that we went back to our mathematical model and what we did was to input this uh, growth that we observe after this evolution. And when we do input uh, this growth into the model, so for example, in the case of the ancestor competing versus the evolved types of pseudomonas, uh, with this higher growth, we do see that pseudomonas can actually, by just growing better, outcompete compete acinetobacter only after 20 days. Uh, but Actually, 20 days is quite different for 14 days. So we believe that it's not only indirect effects, but they might be actually direct competition. They might be some antagonism or some, um, yeah, some kind of type six secretion system that pseudomonas might be antagonizing acinetobacter in addition to using more resources. So to conclude this part, we see that positive pairwise interaction are stable in a constant environment, that's the uh, cross-feeding environment. And we do see that there's two outcome, outcomes in a fluctuating environment. So we either see coexistence or extinction of one of the species. And uh, I don't have to actually give this take home message to this audience because you're very well aware, aware of this, but our conclusion is that the environmental context matters. So, it really matters who is your neighbor and who is evolving next to you in terms of species. And then in that sense, we should move forward into not only study experimental evolution with single species, but try to do these evolution experiments in a community context, considering interaction with different species. And um, this concludes my talk. I left uh, ample time for questions and I just want to thank the people involved in this project in Switzerland, so uh, my postdoc advisor, Martin Ackerman, Clément Villain, and Jean-Claude, uh, who helped so much with the sequence, also the whole lab in Switzerland, and the funding, which uh, mostly came from EMBO and from the adaptation to a changing environment from ETH Zurich. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for the nice uh, talk. So we have uh, time for questions. So if you have any, please uh, use the raise and tool or uh, type it in the chat. And uh, while we are waiting, I can ask uh, one question since we have a lot of time. Uh, so have you tried to do uh, a co-culture experiment where you put uh, the uh, pseudomonas evolved in uh, or the acid, uh, uh, Acinetobacter evolved uh, in uh, co-culture that coexisted with the uh, pseudomonas that actually outcompeted the acinetobacter. So sort of to, uh, well, probably technically is difficult, but to um, isolate the evolved strains in different experiments and pair them together across different experiments. Yeah, no, absolutely. That, that's a that great one. So we did like a preliminary experiment with only one replicate. And unfortunately, then the pandemic hit and we couldn't ah. continue this experiment because this is definitely the way when we can test this hypothesis. So evolving these clones. So what I can say is from our preliminary experiments, uh, which I have here. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is evolving, like competing these clones um, uh, at generation uh, 92. Mm -hmm. And actually from these pairwise competitions of the evolved clones, we do not see 
this extinction of Acinetobacter. As you can see, Consortium 1 and 2, which is the one that Acinetobacter is supposed to go extinct, actually, we do not see this. But this was with one replicate, and we definitely have to um, repeat these experiments. And also, the conditions were not fully optimized to replicate the conditions from the experiments. But definitely, we need to be trying to play with these um, evolved clones versus ancestors and these kind of replicate transplants uh, kind of ideas to try to test these hypotheses. So, so far it seemed like it's really at the population level and not at the clone level that we do see these behaviors. So we don't know exactly what's going on if we didn't isolate the proper clone or uh, if it's something that is really characteristic to a whole population with whole uh, like genetic diversity in some sense. Mm -hmm. uh, there is one question from uh, uh, Flavia. Oh, oh, yes. Can you hear me? Oh, yes. Okay, cool. Uh, very nice talk. Congratulations. Um, I'm interested to understand if you can measure somehow if these uh, bacteria that you work with, if they differ somehow in their mutation rate or um, how they evolve? <laughs> yeah, no, that's a very great question. So um, we definitely uh, tested the, the mutation rate. So they have very similar mutation rates, these two species. So we thought for some reason that Pseudomonas might evolve um, faster because that's kind of a common belief in the literature, but they are actually very similar in terms of mutation rate. And in many other ways, they, they tend to be similar species. So um, they, they have the same substitution rate, for example. So. OK, OK. Yeah, I was, I was curious because of that. Maybe, I don't know if there is any other bacteria that you can select and, and make an experiment with this different rate of mutation or, I don't know, just uh, yeah, I'm no, that's that's a very good point. Right? Yeah, that would be super exciting to start tuning uh, like this uh, mutation rate and to start seeing like how like by like yeah tuning the mutation rate in either like uh, very fast evolving versus slow evolving like how yeah. we can in all dynamics and that's definitely possible and that's definitely something I would like to do in the future. Okay, I'll look for it. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, great, we have uh, time for more questions, if uh, any. Uh, hi, I have a question. Sorry, <laughs> that's my video. Thank Bye. you very much for your very interesting talk. Um, I had uh, one question I wanted to ask about the plot. Uh, when you've done longer time, like when you didn't look anymore, like when you wanted to look at the evolution, so you took longer time, I think up to 28 days. Maybe I didn't get it uh, from the talk. Like, did you keep the subculturing time like at every day? Or yes, it was, yes. it was in the batch, okay. Yes. Yes, okay. so we didn't adjust anything um, based on how they start evolving, so. Mm -hmm. We didn't adjust that, so we just for uh, for now for simplicity we just kept it content to twenty four hour cycles, uh, regardless of the if they are fast evolving faster and like they are like growing faster and saturating yeah. faster. Like we we ignore that part for simplicity for for now. Yeah, and and in the case like because uh, at some point in this kind of experiment when you see the uh, the the, um, the abundance decreasing. Of course, because they are going towards extinction. Uh, did you like? Is it possible to adjust the, the amount that you subculture? Because of course, if you subculture, you're gonna take a smaller amount of cells, and that can uh, kind of a, a bit bias like the the direction towards extinction. Um, yeah. Yeah, actually, it, that's a very interesting um, point because we we did the experiment starting at different ratio. So starting either at very high density, because we wanted to make sure it was not just st stochasticity in the terms yes. of just ecological stochasticity. Ah, stos yes. 
So actually, we repeated this experiment, not in a ratio one to one, but starting with a lot of acinetobacter. And even starting with a lot of acinetobacter compared to Pseudomonas, we still see the same this decrease to extinction. So okay. it seems it's definitely not um, this, uh, this other kind of stochasticity. Perfect, yeah. And if I can ask, like, I mean, this is a further curiosity because I really enjoy this topic. Um, like, are you thinking or is it interest at all like to uh, test co-fluctuations? Like uh, more than one parameter fluctuating? Because in this case, you apply fluctuation in the nutrient supply. But like, would it be of any interest to, to model and then apply fluctuation, let's say, in temperature or another like increasing the heterogeneity of the environment? Oh, absolutely. So one of the experiments that, yeah, we're very excited is like to somehow try to um, add abiotic stress to this. Mm -hmm. So for example, yeah, temperature is a great, uh, it's a great like kind of suggestion and something we thought about it and then try to tune a little bit more again what would happen if we favor more one than the other? In this particular case, for example, what would happen if we favor the, the one that is not doing so great, like acinetobacter? So yeah, definitely, I, in a way, I feel like this is just the start of uh, setting up the system and playing with it. And now is the fun part because we can actually start testing a lot of uh, ecological and evolutionary theories and tuning stuff. And actually this system is nice because we can definitely tune interaction, evolutionary rates, and many things. We can also add more species if it's- Yes, because. yes. Thank you very much, very interesting. Yeah, thank you. Uh, great, there is uh, another question from Aditya. Hello, um, thank you for the talk. So I was wondering, um, so I guess you showed here that when you have evolution, in the case of a um, externally imposed fluctuating environment, it destabilizes the coexistence. But so we saw some we saw some talks earlier having to do with bacteriophage interactions. In this case, the fluctuations are internally driven by the by the dynamics of the different strains. And in that case, I think we we saw something like um, um, that evolution can can change the dynamics qualitatively by by changing the direction of the of the cycles between bacteria and phage um, in, in, in phase phase. But I, I guess like, I'm not sure if I have a specific question, but I would just be interested in like, whether you can comment on the difference between externally driven um, and internally driven um, uh, fluctuations and whether these are having, whether you think these might have qualitatively different effects on, on coexistence or not. Yeah, no, that, that's a great, great point. So actually, I mean, reviewing literature, I feel like this uh, interesting uh, fluctuating dynamics is mostly given by these interactions that are either predation or, um, or like, you know, like where you have like more like a plus minus interaction, mm -hmm. or you can have a plus plus interaction. But in this particular case, when you have just competition or commensalism, it's kind of interesting not to observe these internal fluctuations. It seems like it really like this is more prone, it's more likely to happen with certain kind of interactions than with other kind of interactions. So in this particular case, um, yeah, we do not see anything of that sort. But, yeah, but uh, do you think that, do you, so do you think that exogenous versus endogenous interactions or like, um, would they qualitatively uh, have different effects on on coexistence? Is I guess my question. Mm, yeah, I don't know. Like, it's hard to. I haven't think about it to be honest with you, but I think that's a really great uh, thing to think about. It's definitely like it gives me like some something to think about. I don't mm -hmm. know how to answer, <laughs> but it's a great point. It's really a great point. What, what you. is your intuition? Thank you. Okay. Great. Uh, if there is any more question, please uh, type it in the chat or raise hand. Um, I don't see anyone. Okay. So thanks a lot, uh, Ale, again for this uh, very nice uh, talk. Um,
Thank you very much for answering all the questions.